it deals with the following problem. I give you as an input a matrix A, such as this 2 by 3 matrix with rows 3, 2, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, which represents a, uh, a binary cubic. I take this matrix and I feed it into a black box. The, uh, the name of the black box is AG slash 0510126, which is the paper with this title that we wrote with uh, Eva Maria Feichner and Alicia Dickenstein. And then the black box runs for a while and it produces the Newton polytope of the discriminant. It produces the, uh, the vertices, maybe all faces. So it produces all the leading monomials. And in fact, we can also tune it that will it give us the coefficient. So if you're interested, for instance, in this coefficient 27 or you know, 4 over there, it will do that too. It will not give you the other monomials. It will not give you the monomials that are in the interior, but it will tell you all the leading monomials and describe the Newton polytope for you. Now, why is that a good thing to do? Well, Ben, yesterday, gave me a 6 by 45 matrix A and says, gee, I'd like to calculate the discriminant of this 6 by 45 matrix because it tells me something interesting about K3 surfaces for his thesis research at Brown. He fed that matrix or version thereof to some you know, computer algebra system, such as Macaulay. And he said, oh, calculate the discriminant. And then he waited a couple months. <laughs> and then he killed the process. Now, that's a common experience that everybody has who uses you know, computational algebra. You see slick presentations like, you know, Mike and me and Judy and Punch presenting Macaulay too. And then you go home, you try it on your example, and then you know, three months later you kill the process. Now why is that? Is that because the computer algebra systems are so bad? No, that's because you asked the wrong question. No computer algebra system will compute for you in general the full discriminant of a 6 by 45 matrix, because if you could, the size of the output would have more particles than the universe. Yeah, so even if you could compute this object, you don't want to. right? You don't want to compute this object. The output is too big. What you want is you want to have some big, big, big polynomial. right? And it's really bad, right? because A, you can't compute it ever. right? And B, if you wanted to compute it, if you could compute it, you wouldn't want to. Right? So, what you should ask instead, you should ask questions about this polynomial. So now you have this input matrix, it's huge, you know, and you can never, ever hope to compute all five terms of this polynomial, right? <laughs> Let's say. But you could ask questions about this polynomial. You could ask, I wonder what's the degree of this polynomial? Well, to determine the degree of this polynomial, you only need one of these green leading monomials, and you can read off the degree. You can even look the refined degree. Degree in general is some kind of cohomology class. So to read the degree or the refined notion of degree, all you need is one of these green monomials. You might have want some information about deformations of your situation. Maybe it's enough to look at one facet. You might want to know what's going on in characteristic 3. Then maybe you want the upper right monomial. Okay? So, the meaningful questions are that you might have about big discriminants are you want to ask questions about the discriminant. If you want to have a black box that lets you answer these questions, but the one question in general that you don't want to ask is compute the full discriminant. You can do that for small discriminants, such as the 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 hyperdeterminant which has only 2.8 million terms. For small examples like this, you can actually compute the expansion. But in general, these discriminants will have many, many, many more terms than 2.8 million. OK, so in the land of Toblerone, I spent the summer. I was a guest of Eva Maria Feichner, and Alicia came to visit us. And we basically wrote this paper, which gives an explicit 
combinatorial description of the tropicalization of the A discriminant. Recall the A discriminant is a certain irreducible variety in the space of coefficients, which usually has co-dimension 1, occasionally has higher co-dimension, and we will compute the tropicalization and then using the black box, and then based on the tropicalization, we will answer, hope to answer, the kind of questions that Ben might be interested in, such as what is the degree or the co-dimension. Now, the advance here, let me stress this, the advance here is that A can be any integer matrix, and not just the integer matrices A that come from smooth toric varieties. So if A represents a smooth toric variety, such as a Segre embedding of a product of projective spaces, or a Veronese embedding of a projective space, then uh, our techniques don't add very much beyond what Gelfan, Kapranov, and Zelovinsky have already done. So if you have in the smooth case, then probably you're better off using Gelfan, maybe you're better off, I'm not sure, but you certainly could use Gelfan, Kapranov, Zelovinsky. So the advance here is that A is any integer matrix, and the description is self-contained. You don't have to read the green book. And if the co-dimension hap happens to be 1, then uh, you also get the Newton polytope. And you can answer these questions. So let me illustrate this for the family of elliptic curves. So if I put the full family of elliptic curves into the black box, what will it do? So this is the input. Okay, so this picture represents a 3 by 10 matrix A whose columns are called A, B, C, D, up to G. So this is the input to the black box. Now I hit return, and out comes the Newton polytope of the discriminant of this family very rapidly. And so there are many ways of, so behind this is now the Newton polytope. Now, a Newton polytope, a polytope in general, in the first lecture we learned, can be given either as the convex hull of a bunch of points or as a solution set to a linear system of inequalities. So here I'm actually giving this in the second form. So I'm giving you, so a linear system of inequalities, equations and inequalities. Um, that, uh, that's the Newton polytope. Okay? So let's look at this output. So this is a polytope in 10-dimensional space. And by mild abuse of notation, I'm going to call the coordinates on this 10-dimensional space also A, B, C, up to J. They are the, uh, OK. So they correspond to the, uh, the columns of the input matrix. The inter there's the input matrix, right? That's the matrix A. It's right there. So this is the, this is the matrix A, that, that the input matrix. So this description have two, has two parts. Uh, first of all, there is a linear system of equations. So A, dot my vector, is a certain right-hand side. So the right-hand side, in this case, is the vector 4, 4, 4. That's called the, the multi-degree or the A-degree. So, so the vector 4, 4, 4 is a fancy way of saying 12. Okay, so I, I think about the number 12 here as the vector 4, 4, 4. So that's going to be the degree of my discriminant. That's 4, 4, 4. So this discriminant has degree 4, 4, 4. And that is, of course, our smallest form of written number question. Oh, because there are three directions. Because the, uh, yeah, because the vial group for S, it's SL3, that same three. So there are three sort of directions. That's why it's three groups. And the matrix has three rows. So for any matrix A, there will be an equation like this. Now then notice that these A, B, C up to J, they should be non-negative. So already in the first line of this description, I have 10 inequalities. 
right? So I have 10 non-negativity ne non constraints on the unknowns. So the first line says I have a vector of length 10, and the coordinates are non-negative. So those non-negativities are 10 constraints, inequalities. Then I have my three equations. And then I have nine more linear inequalities. So for instance, 2a plus b plus c should be greater or equal to. And then at the end, I have 2g plus d plus h plus i plus j is greater or equal to 3. And so there you can see in the picture, again, there are three symmetry classes. Okay? So this is a very compact description of the Newton polytope, of the discriminant, of this uh, general family of elliptic curves. And it's given by, it's a, it's a polytope in 10-dimensional space. But it's a seven-dimensional polytope because it satisfies three linearly independent linear relations. This seven-dimensional polytope has at most 18 facets because it's cut out in its seven-dimensional space by 18 linear inequalities, 18, 19. Hmm. OK, one of them will go away. So the E, the non-negativity of E will go away. So it's a polytope having at most 19 facets. It's defined by 19 linear inequalities. 10 of them are just the non-negativity constraints. And then there are nine coming in three groups of three additional inequalities. And that would be the output of the black box for this example. Eight? Oh, eight, 18. I'm right. Yeah? One, two, I couldn't count right. Yes. No, no, it's 18. It's correct. It is 18. They're all facets. So the number of facets of this thing is 18. No, the, actually, once you write it out, it's always modulo the row space of A. It's, it, this is correct. I'll, I'll have a picture. So let me show you the picture that goes with this. Great, so this is it. So now this is a small little polytope. So uh, it's a seven-dimensional polytope. Um, and this, you know, you find it has 133 vertices, 513 edges, 846 two-dimensional faces, 764 three-dimensional faces, and so on. And it has 18 six-dimensional faces. And the 18 six-dimensional faces are the subsets where, you know, one of these inequalities holds as an equation. Okay. So that is our polytope. Now, Fernando, I wonder how many lattice points are there in this polytope? <laughs> 2040, OK? We didn't know this, but now we can run lattice. There's very easy to use software where you type in, you know, you say, how many integer solutions are there to these linear inequalities? And you hit a button, and it says 2040. Probably it's going to say 2,103, and there might be some that have coefficient 0 in the expansion. But it's some number very close to 2,040. And now we can ask further questions. Right? But this kind of gives us a description of this polynomial. Uh, here's a little story about the facets. So the 18 facets come in four classes, have you seen? And uh, here is sort of pictures that, that represent them. So uh, if you think about A, B, C, J as uh, heights on this uh, diagram, so you take this diagram and you uh, plot. You think about A, B, C up to G as heights. So you make a three-dimensional pictures. And you look at it from below. Then on the facets, you're going to see these uh, types. And uh, anyway, so there are 10 that sort of cut off vertices or um, well, the interior ones are a little special. Then the second group corresponds to a course of subdivisions like this. And then there are three more like this. And this is the answer to Bjorn's question. They're not three types like this. They're only two, actually. Is that this one? Yeah, I think this one only. Is that right? Oh, I'm missing one. 
Maybe I'm missing one. Okay, but in any case, there will be 18 in the end. And there's a way of making pictures like this for the facets. And that's a very common feature about these uh, discriminants. Usually, in fact, always, the number of facets is much smaller than the number of vertices. So first of all, the number of vertices is much smaller than the number of terms. So 2,040 is a number that's giant, right? We can never, ever write down all 2,040 terms. But maybe we can write down the 133 extreme monomials. But really, we should sort of look at the 18 facets. They carry a lot of geometric information. They carry sort of the ball as far as the generations uh, of, this universe, of this family is concerned. So the 18 facets are the ones that we should really focus on. OK, so this is how the black, what the black box does. It's based on the following theorem. So this is the main theorem of the talk. So this theorem is called tropical horn uniformization. So horn uniformization is a, a parametric representation of the discriminant due to Kapranov. And our main result says that Kapranov's horn uniformization tropicalizes very gracefully. So that's our theorem. So let me say it precisely. So we're given our matrix A. We look at the kernel of A. So the kernel of A, it's just, you know, it's a linear variety in projective n minus 1 space. Okay, so this is just the system of d independent linear equations. And the solution set will be a linear space of co-dimension d or of dimension n minus d minus 1. That's the kernel of A. Now, its tropicalization can be computed from the matroid of A. It's very easy. You can calculate. You can solve these equations tropically, piatically, using GFAN. So you can make a picture of all the weight vectors W, which survive in Mike Stillman's you know, test this morning, uh, uh, yesterday morning. Okay, So you write down the D linear equations in N unknowns. Um, coming from the rows, and then uh, you write down, you calculate the tropical variety tau of kernel of A, and that's a, a fan, a union of cones, and these cones have dimension n minus d minus 1, right? So it's the same dimension as the linear space. So here's the main theorem. The tropical A discriminant, which is the uh, tropicalization of the irreducible variety delta A, is the sum, the pointwise sum, the Minkowski sum, of the classical old-fashioned linear space spanned by the rows of A with the tropical linear space determined by the kernel of A. In symbols, so here the boxed equation, so the tropical discriminant is the sum, the pointwise sum of the row space of A plus the tropicalization of the kernel of A. So what this means is that every point in here is a sum of a point in here plus a point in there. Now let's see why this makes sense. So the row space of A is a d-dimensional space, but you know, really, um, when projective space, so it actually turns out that it's a, a d minus one space. Okay. Now the kernel of A is an n minus d minus one space. It just we draw it tropically, right? Now, if these two are in general position with respect to each other, right? the first guy has dimension d minus 1. The second guy 
has dimension n minus d minus 1. Well, if they are in general position with respect to each other, their sum will have dimension n minus d minus 2. Meaning it has co-dimension 1, and it's the discriminant, the tropical discriminant. Okay? So the dimension of the tropical discriminant, of course, equals the dimension of the ordinary discriminant. That's our, that was the, one of our theorems. So uh, saying that the, uh, the discriminant has co-dimension 1 says that uh, this linear space and this tropical linear space are in general position with respect to each other. And if they're not, if they're sort of, uh, they meet non-transversely, then possibly the dimension can drop. OK, this would be a good moment to ask for a question, because this is the only theorem in this lecture. Well, almost. This is the main theorem. There's one more theorem coming. So your dimension comes with d minus 1 and n minus d minus 1? That's correct. And those add up to what? That should just be n minus 2. Oh, I'm sorry. D minus, yeah. So the row space, d minus 1. Let's try to get this right. I don't have to. I have my, OK. So A is a d by n matrix that contains the all one vector. Right? So if you think about it the right way, this will be d minus 1 plus n minus d minus 1. And that adds up to n minus 2. N minus two. Yes, exactly. Okay. Great. Okay, so let's try this. So thinking about it in the right projective way, these are the dimensions. Still early in the morning, right? So if you add these two things up, that says the expected co-dimension is 1. Okay? And, and that's what we get. OK, so now we have the, uh, the tropical discriminant computed as a fan. Now, how can we actually recover the Newton polytope? How can we you know, run the black box? We need one more ingredient to actually run the black box. So suppose delta A is a hypersurface. It has co-dimension 1. Now, of course, we get a test for this, right? We just check you know, whether these two sum ends are you know, it's just a linear algebra test, right? whether they are in general position with respect to each other or not. So the formula gives a test. So let's suppose you know, we look at these, uh, this, these, the row space and the kernel, tropicalized. We check that they meet transversally. So then, now we want to actually calculate the Newton polytope um, of the discriminant. So this is a certain polytope that has this thing as its normal fan. Let's recall, right? So delta A is some big unknown hypersurface. Tau of delta A is the union of all co-dimension 1 cones in the normal fan. So it's a union of co-dimension 1 cones, 1 for each edge of the big unknown polytope. Okay, so we have some big unknown 7-dimensional polytope. Um, the number of edges of this unknown polytope is the number of maximal cones in the fan we just computed. So now I want to build the polytope. So here's how we do it. So recovering the Newton polytope is based on the following theorem. So this theorem says, if you know the normal fan of an unknown Newton polytope, that is, if you know a tropical hypersurface, you can, well, you can't recover the hypersurface, but you can recover the polytope. And here's how it goes. So let's pick a generic weight vector w and r to the n. So generic, maybe, you know, coordinates are algebraically independent over q. So W is a term order. So Mike gives me a term order. G bound, I wonder what would be the lexiographically leading monomial of this big unknown discriminant, OK? Then I will answer this question by telling Mike the exponent of xi in the leading monomial, so in W of delta A. So delta A is some huge polynomial that has more terms than particles on the universe, but I'm going to reveal to Mike 
the leading monomial of this polynomial with respect to his choice of term order, okay? And I'm gonna do that by telling him what's the power of xi in this monomial. Let me not worry about the leading coefficient, okay? Let me just give you the monomial. So what I do is I take Mike's W, and that's a point in Rn. So I plot W as a point in Rn, and I'm gonna stand on this point. Now this black point, since Mike gave me a generic point, will not lie on the blue picture. Though the blue picture is the tropical hypersurface that I've calculated using the left theorem. Since that has co-dimension one. So we assume the blue thing, you know, is some fan of co-dimension one in some big space. Okay, so this is some co-dimension one fan in a 45-dimensional space. Okay, and I have a description of it. And you give me a vector w of length 45. So now I'm going to go on this point, W, and I'm going to shoot a ray in direction EI. So I want to know what's the power of X17 in this monomial. So I'm going to start a ray in direction, in the 17th coordinate direction, and I, whenever I cross the tropical hypersurface, I say beep, 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 okay? And this will happen finitely many times, right? Since W was picked generically, as I shoot my ray from W in direction EI, I will say beep only finitely many times. Whenever I say beep, I add up a positive integer, which is the determinant of the intersection, right? I have a rational hyperplane meeting a rational ray. There's an integer, which is the lattice determinant, right? So I have a a co-dimension one lattice and a one-dimensional lattice, and they meet each other, and they, you know, they span right a finite index subgroup. And so whenever I say beep, I add up you know, 17, 5, 8, whatever the lattice intersection of my intersection is. That's a sum of positive integers, and then I'm going to report to Mike that sum of positive integers. I tell him the variable xi in this monomial has power whatever the sum of the beep numbers is. So that's the theorem. So this is the counting multiplicity. So, so there are a few technical points that I swept under the rug, but basically that's the theorem. Okay? So implementing this is a different story, but basically this is how it goes. Ben? How do you get the coefficient for the I don't in general. I can in this case, but I won't talk about it. Kathy? Uh -huh. um, be, uh, yes, I can explain that. It has to do, uh, what, what's the notion of a, tr that's a very good question. Why a half ray? Why not a full ray? And that has the following answer. So how do you calculate, uh, in classical old-fashioned algebraic geometry, how do you calculate the degree of a hypersurface geometrically? Well, you shoot a line through it, right? So you pick a general line, and you know you count how many times does the general line meet the hypersurface? Well, I'm doing the same thing here. Let's just pretend this picture were in the plane, right? Except I, I do a tropical line, right? So a tropical line looks like this. So a tropical line, right? So a tropical line is a union over the ground field, right? So a tropical line is a union of half rays. So I'm doing exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing as in classical algebraic geometry. I intersect my hypersurface with a general line, except the line is a tropical line. Right? So in a tropical line in 45-dimensional space, let's say in P44, so in Ben's situation, the line I pick is a union of 45 half rays, one for each of the coordinates. Does that answer your question? Okay, so those are the only two theorems in this lecture. So let's see what we can do with them. So using these two theorems, I build my black box. Right? So the first part of the black box, it does this computation. And then the second part of the black box does that computation. And then I get the Newton polytope. It looks as if the number of intersections points would just have on exactly where Ah, very good question. Repeat, Bjorn asked the question, doesn't this depend on where W is located? 
Okay? And the answer is no. Because the, any tropical, any blue tropical variety satisfies the residue theorem. So the residues theorem, once you translate it into this language, gives you a balancing condition, which says, suppose I'm somewhere on this blue tropical variety. This is true for any tropical variety whatsoever, right? So it's a, it's a piecewise linear space with a rational structure. So let's say I'm somewhere on this piecewise linear space, and I look at all the directions that are emanating. Suppose I'm on one of these blue nodes, then the rays are balanced in the sense that if I take the sum of the lattice directions, they sum to zero. So let me say this again. Didn't say this very well. So here, right, so I'm in this tropical variety. This is some piece. And I take the first lattice point in this direction. And I take the first lattice point in that direction. And I take the first lattice point in that direction. The sum of those three blue vectors is zero. And that was actually, so one of the historic sources of, of this is a paper by a George Bergman, our colleague, who wrote a paper in 1971 called The Logarithmic Limit Set of an Algebraic Variety, and he already observed this uh, balancing condition. It's a consequence of the residue theorem. That I guess if you have a rational function, right, on P1 or something, they sum to zero. Okay. And as a result, okay, and the consequence of that is that you can, if you pick a different W, then it's invariant. So if you have a blue co-dimension one complex that satisfies the balancing condition, then it will not depend on what term order Mike gives me. I'm still a little confused. I mean, suppose you took omega on the same half rate but higher up. Yes. And it would miss out on something. Well, if I move up, right, then let's say I move here. Let's make it red. So let's take, say I take a different line. Like this. Oh, so you intersect not just with the half rate, yeah. but the whole Oh, the monomial will change, right? So this blue thing, yeah, so this is, you know, two, one, three. Then I get a different leading monomial. So if Mike gives me the term order W, then I would report the leading monomial is x1. Right, so Mike gives me the green term order. I say your leading monomial is x1. If Bjorn gives me the red term order w prime, then your leading monomial is x3. Right, so I get a different leading monomial, but they have the same degree. Okay. Tomorrow I'm going to state uh, a theorem that explains how this works in higher co-dimension. But I think in co-dimension one, I think it's clear, right? I have this union, I have this blue hypersurface. It's balanced. As I move my term order around, of course, the leading terms will be different, right? Different term orders will be giving different leading terms, but the, there's an invariance of degree. And, uh, and the invariance of degree is equivalent to saying the balancing. Question? For the intersection multiplicity, you, so you said you take it to uh, take it two sub lattices. Yes, the omega and the other, and that's you, correct. Do you just add them and do you take the saturation or do you just add them? Uh, they are saturated. So I just take, yeah, good question. So I just take a rational co-dimension one space and I take the lattice of all lattice points in it. And I have a, so I have a, a rational vex, vector subspace of dimension one and a rational vector subspace of co-dimension one. I pick a lattice basis for the saturated lattices. I make an n by n matrix of integers, and I take the absolute value of the determinant. And that's a positive formula. Okay? That's a positive number. OK, let's see what we can do with this. So, so remember this formula. Let's keep that up. OK, so this is the ex an example that we discussed at 11 PM in my group yesterday. So A is this 3 by 6 matrix. So this represents the general family of quadratic curves in the projective plane. Okay? 
So I have the family that's a six-dimensional family, or projectively it's a P5. So I take the full family of all quadratic curves in the plane, and that's the matrix A, and that's the, uh, the polytope, the picture of the columns of A that goes with this. So I wonder under what condition on the six coefficients a quadratic curve in the plane might acquire a singularity. So that's some giant polynomial, that's some condition in x1, x2, up to x6. And I like to apply my black box to analyze this condition. So I like to know there's some hypersurface in this space with coordinates x1 up to x6. And being on that hypersurface um, means that my quadratic curve acquires a singularity. So just to make sure that we're on the same page, what's the degree of this hypersurface? Three, right? Three, okay. That's right. So there's a certain hypersurface of degree three called the determinant of the symmetric matrix, right? It's the uh, discriminant of a quadratic ternary form, okay? But we don't know that, right? That's, we've never heard about discriminants of quadratic forms. So we're going to discover them now, okay? So the goal is... We're going to discover automatically by running the black box, we hope to discover that there is such a thing as the discriminant of a quadratic form. So we don't know about this. Okay. okay, so the first thing we do is we calculate the tropicalization of the kernel. So the tropicalization of the kernel is this picture. And I need to explain this. So the kernel of A is a three-dimensional vector space or it's a two-dimensional space in P5. So the kernel of A is a plane in P5. Okay? Now, therefore, the tropicalization is a two-dimensional fan. It's a union of 18 two-dimensional cones. So it's a fan that has nine rays and 18 two-dimensional cones. Now, we make a big sphere, a big four-dimensional sphere. We make a, a beach volleyball in dimension four, and we intersect this two-dimensional fan with the volleyball. We get a graph, and that's the graph. So we get nine black vertices in this graph. Those correspond to the rays in the fan. And then we get, uh, is this 18? Yeah, I think 18 red edges. So they correspond to the 18 two-dimensional cones in my two-dimensional tropical linear space, okay? So that's the picture, and that we get automatically using GFAN. Okay, that's almost there, right? Now all we need to do is we need to, and there's a purely combinatorial way of doing that, okay? And now we need to add in, so now here we have this object. This is a two-dimensional fan, right? Now, here we have the row space of A, which is a, also a three-dimensional vector space. Or, you know. So we add these two together. Now, it's a little complicated, right? You have this two-dimensional fan. You add something three-dimensional. It looks like you get something five-dimensional. But you know, adding a vector space, so you think about it for a moment. You're in some Rn, right? And you have some subset. Suppose you have a, a subset of Rn, and your task is to add in a line. Well, let's add in a line. So my, my hand is the subset, right? So I'm adding in the line, right? So I take everything that's swept out by my fist. Now, that's equivalent to projecting my fist onto this wall over there, right? So adding in a line, right, is equivalent to projecting the set. So rather than adding in the row space of A, I might as well, you know, take the co-kernel of the transpose of A. I might as well mod out by the row space of A, right? So uh, adding in a linear space is the same thing as projecting along the linear space. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to take this picture. I'm going to project along the row space of A. And then I get this picture. Okay. I get this picture. So this is now a two-dimensional fan in a three-dimensional vector space. The three-dimensional vector space is the co-kernel of the transpose of A, right? So I take the co-kernel of the transpose of A. That's a three-dimensional space, and I've drawn a two-dimensional fan. Now, these four of these, three of these uh, black rays went away. They were mapped to the origin under this map. And then you can see, right, so 
this is a, a ray, these go to the origin, and there we get this nice fan. That would be the edge graph of a certain three-dimensional polytope. I wonder what that polytope is. Maybe one of the students. Are you a student? Okay. The last Toblerone goes to Abinev. Abinev, okay. So we can see that the image of our tropical linear space uh, becomes a, a graph. And that's the normal fan of the Newton polytope of delta A. And we found the Toblerone. OK, now we're almost there. So this was the first part of the black box. So now we need to do the second part. So we've carried out this calculation. So now we need to carry out this calculation, right? So now this blue thing over there, so now we need to do, now this red over there is the blue over there. Okay, sorry about that. So now we have this, uh, this fan over there that's blue in the three-dimensional space, which is the co-kernel of the transpose of A. And now we, you know, now Bjorn and Mike and all of you will give me W's, and I'm going to do this stabbing business. And there we go. Okay, so now... Well, how many times do I have to stab? Well, I have to do it only five times, right? One for each face of the Toblerone, right? So because this fan, this fan in three-dimensional space divides, you know, three-dimensional space into five regions corresponding to the f five faces, right? So it, this Toblerone has five faces. So you don't have to give me all that many term orders. All you need to do is give me five term orders. Then for each of these five W's, I'm going to run this thing, and I get these leading monomials. And in this case, I can get the coefficients too, and I don't have time how to get them. But you know, you see like two to the two appearing. Um, great, that's it, right? So now we can take the dual to the Toblerone. That's the bipyramid. And that's the Newton polytope of the discriminant. So the output, so for each of the five regions, so now the dual polytope of the Toblerone is the bipyramid. So the bipyramid is a polytope that has five vertices, nine edges, and six facets. And now these vertices are labeled by the five blue monomials that I found. And so the answer is, uh, the discriminant is a certain polynomial, certain mysterious unknown polynomial, uh, whose Newton polytope is this bipyramid, and those are its leading monomials. So the answer is three. Question. I think this, <coughs> the discriminant subvariety has sort of deeper structure, right? Because the, the, we know somehow that this is. Oh yeah. So okay. So now we've learned. What have we learned? Right now we make an educated guess. Right. What? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, among the matrices that determine zero, you have the ones of rank two and the ones of rank one. Very good question. Can you see that here? Uh, that's why we're working on it right now. So right now we're trying to understand the singularities of the discriminant. It's extremely important. So you take the discriminant. Let's say the discriminant is a hypersurface. And then the singular locus of the hypersurface breaks up into components. And then each component of the single locus we look at the single locus, and it breaks up into components and so on. That's an extremely, extremely important structure, uh, and we're trying to tropicalize this entire stratification, and it ties into lots of good stuff, and I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Okay, so this was sort of a silly example, right? We already knew this. I just wanted to make a point. Of course, we know that we know the discriminant of a quadratic form, so, but we've learned the discriminant. Okay. Let's do a real example. So I have eight minutes left. So in the last eight minutes of this talk, I'll do one example. But maybe there are other questions. OK, let's do one example. So the example I'm going to do now is the one that you looked at for a year. Namely, that's the one that's in my course description. So I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to run the same algorithm on this 4 by 8 matrix. OK, 
Okay, so, so the first thing we do, whenever we see a matrix like this, okay, we, apl we apply LLL to the row space. I don't like 53 and 47. I'm going to replace this matrix with another matrix that's perfectly equivalent that has nicer coordinates. Okay, so step before I even start. You know, if you, whenever you see a matrix like this that has big integers, you apply, you know, an element, you apply, a, a, you know, row operations, and the row operations don't change anything. Anything I said, you know, was invariant under under multiplying by an invertible matrix on the left, and so I pick these coordinates, okay? So I like these a little better. So I pick the, the lattice reduction, and I take this matrix. So now I'm going to call the columns of this matrix A, B, C, D for the first group, and the grouping comes from the first two rows. It's a structured matrix, and the second set of columns I'm going to call R, S, T, U, and I'm trying to main, I will try to maintain the color coding. So there are four blue columns and there are four red columns. Now, what does this mean? What does this matrix mean? Well, that's explained, of course, in the, that's of course explained in the course description, which you read half a year ago. This matrix corresponds to a system of two polynomials in two variables. F blue, a blue polynomial F, whose coefficients are A, B, C, D, and a red polynomial G, whose coefficients I call R, S, T, and U. And these are two polynomials in two green unknowns, X and Y, and then the uh, powers, they're just the colors. Okay? So that's equivalent. So this is a so-called Cayley matrix of a system of two equations and two unknowns. Now, in the course description, I asked, for random choices of the coefficients, how many solutions do these have, right? So, like yesterday morning in the talk with Mike, we have two equations and two unknowns. Gee, I wonder how many common intersection points these two curves will have in the plane. And the answer is 24. Okay. So by Bernstein's theorem, the... Uh, the number of solutions, complex solutions, or in any algebraically closed field, the number of solutions is the mixed volume of the two Newton polygons. So there's a blue Newton polygon of F. So here is the Newton polygon of F, and there's the Newton polygon of G. And based on looking at these, we see that for random coefficients, for generic coefficients, there will be 24 distinct, isolated, reduced solutions over the algebraically closed field, having both coordinates non-zero. OK, that's the number 24. But that's not the one we're interested in. What we're interested in is the discriminant of this situation. So we're interested in the discriminant. The discriminant, delta A, is the unique, up to sign, irreducible polynomial in the eight unknowns, A, B, C, D, R, S, T, U, which vanishes whenever two of these roots come together. Okay, so if there are 23 or fewer roots, or if they're components, right, then this happens on a hypersurface and coefficient space, and we're interested in this hypersurface. So we can calculate this in Macaulay 2, maybe, by adding in the... Uh, this uh, two by two determinant, right? So one way to do this is you just throw in one more equation, df dx times dg dy, my is equal to dg dx times df dy. So then we have three equations in x and y. They don't look so bad, right? All we need to do is eliminate x and y. Oh, that's easy. I can type this into my favorite computer algebra system. These Macaulay two guys, they don't know what they're doing. I can do this in magma, right? And two months later, I give up. Okay, so, and then that's the situation where we can try the black box. So here are the kind of questions that we like to answer. So what is the degree of this hypersurface, right? So that's the condition. I have two linear systems. I have two families of curves in the plane. I'm interested in the condition that they are meet tangent. Right? I have uh, you know, two families of curves, 
and I'm interested in the condition that they have a tangent, uh, tangency. So what is the degree of this condition? What is the A degree? What's the refined degree of this? What's the Newton polytope? And why should applied mathematicians care? And I think Kathy and Jan can answer this question. Are they here somewhere? OK. So applied mathematicians should also care. Um, running low in time, so let me just present the answer. <clears throat> so this is actually an, an instance of a, an implicitization problem. I'm not going to go into this. So this is the so-called Horn uniformization in this case. Uh, that's a parametric representation of the discriminant. And I wrote at the bottom, Grotendieck in the tropics. So Grotendieck's taught us not to look at a single variety, but to look at families and morphisms. So whatever we do to a single variety, we should do to morphisms and families. So if I tropicalize, I should tropicalize morphisms. So that's what I'm doing. Um, two more slides to go. OK, what the black box returns. So the Newton polytope is a four-dimensional polytope. And this is its vector f vector. Here's the input again. So we're interested in this uh, discriminant. So the black box says that the Newton polytope is a four-dimensional polytope with 74 vertices, 158 edges, 110 two-dimensional faces, and 26 facets. Notice again, the number of facets is smaller than the number of vertices. Those are the ones we should actually look at. Uh, then I get a list of the extreme monomials. So the 74 extreme monomials is a list, and it's bi-homogeneous. It's of degree 47 in the blue unknowns. And it's of degree 49 in the red unknowns. Right. So I get the list of the 74 extreme monomials. And I've learned I've, that the hypersurface has total degree 100, uh, 106. But really, it has a by degree blue 47, red 43. Now that I've learned the Newton polytope, now I can ask the question, can I actually calculate this polynomial? Can I actually you know, calculate the polynomial? So I take this Newton polytope, and I feed it into the software LATTE. LATTE is a software where I feed an inequality presentation of a polytope, and I ask, how many lattice polytopes are there in a given rational polytope? And I feed it in, and then you know, it comes back. It says. The number of lattice points in this Newton polytope is 21,176. So that's the expected number of terms of this polynomial. So I have some big polynomial in eight unknowns. It has approximately 21,000 terms, but only 74 of them are initial monomials in some term. <coughs> Um, here's a distribution, right? So these lattice points, there are 16,186 in the interior of this four-dimensional polytope. There are 4,082 in the relative interior of a three-dimensional face. There are 753 in the relative interior of a two-dimensional face. There are 81 on the edges. And then there are 74 that are zero-dimensional faces. And now I need your help. Because I'm not so good, I'm not as good as Dan Bernstein in linear algebra, in exact linear algebra. Now I like to find the coefficients. I like to actually find the 21,000 coefficients. I like to actually do the linear algebra. You choose finite field, floating point, it, whatever you can do. I like to now find the coefficients. Okay, Help me, please, please, please. So here's a little bit, uh, so what the black box does, OK? So we start with the 60 triangles that I had uh, on the slides in lecture two that represent the linear space. I take the image under the uh, co-kernel map. 
I have a collapse, just like when I learned the Toblerone, there's a collapse, and then there's a three-dimensional fan, with, and so on and so on. So now the task is to find the Newton polytope, and I cannot do it yet. Right? So I have 21,000 monomials in eight variables. And I like to just, I know, I know these are going to be the terms that appear in my polynomial. I have an explicit parametric representation. Right? I know this parametric representation. This is it. Right? So I have 21,000 monomials like this. I have this map. And I know that this is the implicit equation. All I need to do is to find the integer coefficients. All I need to find is the integer relation that's imposed by this. So, well, what, we, what do we try? Right? We tried the NTL integer linear algebra library. Right? So we plugged in random sort of smallish integers for the C's and the T's, and we took maybe 50,000 just to make sure you know, we have enough. Right? Then we make a matrix right, with 50,000 rows and 21,176 columns, and we know there's a unique vector in the kernel. But we need your help to find it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>